Eric Whitney, who is Ghost Main, Eric Instagram messaged Aaron, our drummer, and was just like, hey, man, just wanted to thank you guys for everything you did. Like, I wouldn't have my music career if it wasn't for you guys. Like, he's a Florida kid, grew up listening to you. And Aaron's like, thanks, dude, but we've been trying to get a hold of you. And he hadn't seen the, like, the messages. And he's like, for what? And then we're like, we want you on our song. And you're just checking in to say, thanks for being a band that helped you go. And it was just <laughs> this wild thing. Hey guys, James Wilson Taylor here for Rock Sound. It is the latest of our video calls. We've been chatting to everybody while we're still kind of stuck at home at the minute. And I am delighted to say from under oath, we have Spencer and Tim both on the line right now. How are you, gentlemen? Good, man. How are you? Doing yeah, great. Good. Thank you. Good. good to see you guys, man. Good to see you guys. Yeah, that is kind of how we've started off all of these. Uh, I caught up with Aaron a little bit last year to find out a bit about what you guys have been up to, but just generally hope you guys, your families, loved ones, bandmates all stay in as safe and as well as you can in all this uh, downtime and at home. Um, just generally, before we get into all the very exciting stuff you've been up to, um, how have you been finding, I guess, the longest you've not been on the road in uh, in quite a few years? Spencer, let's start with you, man. How's, uh, how's it all been going for you? <laughs> Dude, it, I mean, at first it was like, I think I adjusted in a, like, oh shit, I got to get as much done as I can. Like, I didn't know, obviously none of us knew how long it would be, but I kind of hit it with like, let me do as much work as I can. Like, you know, we're, we're musicians, we're recording artists, we're guitar players, singers, drummers, whatever. And it seems like you grow up your whole life doing that. And then once you get on the road, you don't get to spend as much time like practicing because you're always performing, you know, or writing even as much. So I was like, well, I got all this downtime. I'm just going to write a shitload of music. So with, with like day three, I just locked myself in a, in my little personal recording space and just wrote music constantly um, until we met up under oath, obviously wrote a new record and uh, yeah, just try to like, be in sessions like I would meet up with friends online and write music together that I wouldn't normally do that and uh even if nothing ever came from it like I just tried to work as much as I could um and stay positive but it, it's definitely been weird I've, I've never been this long I think since I was about 12 or 13 years old gone this long without playing a show in front of humans like we did do those live streams um last year but I just saw like on Instagram the other day, like a reminder, like that was a year ago. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> That's so wild. I'm like, so I am uh, very excited to play again, but I'm also ex like for the first time kind of nervous to play because like our bodies have always been so used to doing what we do. I'm like, man, it's hard to get prepared for a tour, even when we just did one a month ago. Like no matter how hard we go to the gym or how, how active we stay, it's like that first show is like, there's nothing you can do to prepare for that. And now we've been like two years about like, cause our last show, uh -huh. was, uh, we did a residency, like five, four or five shows in Orlando, us and a day to remember 2019 Thanksgiving. And that was the last time we were on stage in front of humans. And we were like, we were going to go write a record and then do the Slipknot tour and a few festivals and then wait for the record to come out. But boom, everything changed uh, for all of us. So Man, yeah, I think it's going to be extremely uh, awesome, yet I'm terrified of <laughs> like us <laughs> dying on so song two, you know? Yeah, you're in the transition period now, right, guys? That's the interesting one. And I'm glad you mentioned the live stream shows, actually, because um, i, I got to tell you, man, like every band I've interviewed over the last year since those came out has cited you guys as being like, that's the one that raised the game. Like that's the one that made us want to do our own thing and, and, and change it. It was such an impressive achievement. Congrats on that guys. Um, Tim, I guess, I guess, I guess same question to you, Tim, you know, about, I guess, staying creative, but particularly with those live stream shows, you know, what were the learnings there? What were the challenges and what have you learned from those shows that you, you think you might take forward as we get back to real shows again? Yeah. I mean, I think the live stream is probably a good example of, the answer to your first question at least for me in the sense of you know similar to spencer it's like we found ourselves grounded but our brains kept going so it just became this like larger idea of how do we do and be under oath when you can't do and be under oath you know and it's like everyone's sitting around and 
some people are in studios and some people are doing this. And by the time we did our live streams, like, there was like five or six out at the time. So it wasn't like, you know, we had this idea. Nobody's heard of it. We built the tech ourselves and we started a whole thing. But what we did do is, in my opinion, attempt to like take all of that energy, like, Sp like Spencer was saying, that we would normally be putting into live shows and creative moments and things and basically just say, how do we create an environment that is uh, that makes sense in this environment and i think the biggest thing for us was like people were doing live streams here or there and then a bunch have come out since and it's all like a camera or multiple cameras and we're all on a stage as a band and we play to the camera and you almost have like a first person shooter video game audience perspective and for us it was like that's more of a bummer than a cool thing to watch it's like everything about a show that you miss and it feels and it's almost the perspective of a show, but you're not actually there and you're not with the community of people and you're not hearing people chant and sweat and jump and do that. So it's like we wanted to create something in the round. And the idea wasn't like, let's replace a live show with a live show on a video. Um, it was let's create a live experience, which is why we did everything in a circle. And I think that was like, to me, the most um, <clears throat> creative and like, I guess, revolutionary quote unquote thing that we did was, you know, anyone can rent a big stadium and blow fire or get lasers and all that stuff. And the, a lot of that stuff's rad, but for us, it's like, I want the viewer, the guest at home, the fan, whoever that is to have perspectives that they don't ever get on tour because we're going to be back to tour sometime. We thought it'd be way sooner than now, but it's like, let's get shots of Aaron that nobody's ever seen. Like everyone hears that Phil live, but now you can see it from like a, you're in the band. And so that's the coolest part about that is like all those perspectives were from the center. We're playing around the center. And so you're on stage and you're almost the seventh member of under oath on stage with us. And I think that perspective and shift kind of took people out of, but this feels like a show and I'm bummed now. Like that whole thing isn't productive in my head creatively and so it's like it's cool but i think that's kind of where we landed and yeah i mean for for us even during quarantine it's like we built these live streams we started writing under oath music uh i have a bar in tampa so we were dealing with shutdowns here on that so we all kept really busy and honestly being at home and quarantining with my family was the coolest like like, like Spee said like the longest he's ever gone since he was 13 without playing a show this is the most time i've ever spent with my family since having kids so it's like if you look at it for the good, you're going to look back fondly. We could all talk about all the shit and all the stuff we're pissed about, but it's like, I think at least for our crew, we got through it really well and we're thankful for that, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, it's a great attitude to have. You know, you got to take this time, not only <clears> see the silver linings, of course, with things like family, but yeah, take that time to find new ways and new outlets to be creative. I think you definitely achieved that with the live stream shows. And it's really exciting to see you guys have been working on a new record as well. So tell me, a little bit about, I guess, how that approach began. I've seen so many artists over the last year have been like, oh, we could get together a little bit at a distance in a studio or we'll do bits over Zoom or we'll all do ideas separately and bring them together. What was your approach? How did it actually begin to come together in terms of writing new music during this weird, weird old time? Well, we, ever, we just got COVID tests and just got in a room together. Um, was it a little scary? Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, there's times where someone would start feeling bad and we'd like, Oh shit. Like Chris, you should stay. Home <laughs> and like, it was a little scary at times, but I think we, you know, under oath doesn't, I think what we learned from, from our previous mistakes is like under oath doesn't really work as like the four main writers, bunch of solo songs and throw them on a record or try to make, those things work. It's like under oath is a product of those four creative minds in a room together, um, all wanting different things, but the same outcome, just different ways to get there And that push and pull and um, collaboration and, you know, just brotherhood that we have is what makes the songs sound like under oath. So we kind of bit the bullet and uh, me and Aaron flew in, to where Tim and Chris live in Florida and got an Airbnb and got some COVID tests and just did the damn thing. So it was all, yeah, it was all done in person. Like we didn't write over the internet. Um, 
for yeah, this record. We, we, and we broke it up because on the last record, there was a lot of people's demos and things. And then we kind of tried to under oath them, quote unquote, and it didn't really work, even though they turned out great. There was that missing component. And like, I think the biggest thing for us was we got in a room and there was, I think there was three writing sessions be like four days, five days and four days. And it was like about 13 days total, but it was like the way it was set up, like every day a new song was written. Like there's songs that we wrote that aren't even on the album. And there wasn't anything that got written theoretically for the album that wasn't written in that total of about two weeks of pre-production in 2020 um, or no, even 2019, September, 2019, I think was our first one. And we just worked and worked and worked. And like, I think the cool thing about it was when you come in for four days and you come out with four or five rough ideas or maybe close to finished ideas, and then you go home for two months, like, you come back and your creativity's reset. And so now another three days, it's like, oh, it's just three days. It's like, oh crap, we have two or three more ideas. And it's like coming out of those sessions so prolifically going, they're not just ideas, they're like good ideas that are now on the record um, was really exciting. And that's kind of why we decided to not even have a producer. It's like, we're do this is working. Like we, we recorded the record where we demoed the record and wrote the record and we just kept that thing going because it worked so well three times. It's like worst case we get done with the record and it's not good. And then we go to a producer if we need help. Um, and we just kind of kept that, kept that going. And I, in my head, uh, we're going to keep that going. I'm actually here right now. This is a studio, but it's like Aaron's in town right now. And we're doing other random stuff that may be under oath, may not. And it's like, we're, we're here. We're always here. And it's like, now it's like place has a soul and we understand what it is. And it's like, we're just ripping, you know? Yeah, no, that's exciting to hear, man. Like I say, it's just, just another example of bands having to adapt. And it seems like you've done that in a really positive way. And the fact that you're backing yourselves in a really cool way, which I think is really, really, really good to see. And it seems to be paying off as well, man. You know, obviously we've got a couple of tastes of, uh, of what's to come already. I want to talk through Hallelujah a little bit because what a lovely reaction that got from the fans. You know, it seems like it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. we're happy you're back. This seems like a really great kind of first proper taster, I suppose, of, uh, of what's to come with the full record. Tell me a little bit about where that track came from and, uh, and how it kind of came to be. That was, uh, I mean, like like Tim said, we had these different writing sessions and um, we had these really good demos. That was, I think that was in the the last set of demos, Tim. Don't, I think it was the one. Uh, maybe. I think it was in the last set. And I, I, the only memory I have of that song is when I was leaving, before we wrote that song at all, I remember moving it was like driving 10, 11 hours in a truck by myself and calling. It was either Aaron or it was Tim. I don't remember who it was. And I was just deliriously on this long drive going like, what if we ripped ourselves off in a way? And I was talking about dangerous business about how that choir still to this day is like this thing that people love that section of, of music that we wrote when we were like 18 years old. And just having a conversation on the phone of like, what if we had a song that the choir is the main thing, not like, oh, well, you wait to the end of the song, you get this choir that plays out to the end and everyone loves that. But like, what if that's like the song the hook, and that yeah. idea sparked one of the, it, it, we brought it up in a writing session. I don't think I even, I think I, I told Aaron or Tim and then when we were in a writing session, one of them were like, brought up, oh, you know, me and Speed had this conversation. And I remember us sitting there with Chris, Chris on the keyboard, piano, and us figuring out what we yeah. wanted the melody to be. Um, yeah, then Aaron, Aaron picked out the... Dun, 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 dun. And we just, yeah. before lyrics were written, we would just play this wide open riff with this like piano. And it felt really empty, but it was like, again, kind of to our growth, it's like, oh, we know where that's going, so let's not add stuff. And I mean, my first memory of that song was, uh, I think it's Aaron's running joke that I hate guitar and I hate my job in the band, but I wanted to write like an electronic, like run the jewels type, um, watch the throne style song. And like, that's why it starts with that 808. And originally there was like, uh, instead of drums, it was like, <laughs> and it was like, I was just pushing a dumb idea and it didn't work. And Aaron's like, dude, you got to have guitars and you got to have real drums. I'm like, but do we? And it's like, yeah, we do. And so it, it started with this really weird, like 
me and Ableton just building this idea. Um, and then, yeah, it, 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 honestly, a lot of the songs start in a very quick way. Like all of our songs are like 20 seconds, like the beginning of Hallelujah is where Hallelujah started with just 808s and a little hi-hat. And what happens is Aaron will go in and play over it. And then he'll literally play to nothing. We'll just find the tempo and he'll play over the first chorus or riff. And then in his head, he kind of already feels like these drums are boring. Am I going faster or slower? And he'll just start ripping, you know, and then I'll be a demo, like trying to eh, eh, like find my way around where he's going. And then we'll just piece it together. And there's certain songs that just start with like, I want a song to feel like this and then go fast. It's like, now we got to write music to that. And then there's other songs yeah. where I think, you know, are more fleshed out and start with more guitar bass or keyboard bass. But the idea that we're able to chase a dumb like 808 intro into a random thought Spencer had to what you hear now is like, that's, that's the whole process for the whole record. That's not like a unique song that was made in a unique way. Like that's how we create music, especially without someone else in the room. And I think yeah, that's really important. It, uh, it, 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 it's like, it's funny because once one person's like little idea sparks and someone's like, no, that's dumb. Like we got to you know, Tim, you got to have guitars over it. And then once it happens, there's four guys in the room shouting and like standing on the chairs behind where Tim's sitting right now, getting excited. And I think that energy is like, I mean, you've seen the Under Oath show, like it's a, Under Oath is like a live band, you know, like I, I always, when I think of our band, I don't think of our, our band as like a band people drive around and listen to every single day. I feel like it's like a, it's more of an experience than it is something you want to hear every day. I could be wrong, but it, it translates that way to me, like when we're writing it too, it's like sitting alone in a room with a guitar and like, coming up with a chord progression to write the perfect melody to doesn't really fall into place with under oath. It's more of like, like catching a feeling with your friends. And then once you're on to something like Tim's idea that Aaron, you know, the 808 thing with no guitars or drums that Aaron didn't like, and then Aaron goes in there and just, just smashes something. And then someone else goes, Oh shit. And like, they're getting excited. And, then, yeah. and that's the thing that we chase. Like, it's not even like, much of a conversation until it comes to lyrics, there's not conversation at all, like really at all. It's just kind of like, I saw Chris like, Ugh, or I see Chris like, Ooh, it's like, oh, okay, we're going somewhere. You know, we're just kind of looking at each other and like, it's, it's a weird process, but I, I, I feel like it's kind of how it is live. Like we we're just looking for that feeling that we get. And that was when we discovered, I mean, we've always had that, but I think when we were, really getting somewhere with the, the pre-pro on this record to where it sounded good. Like our, our equipment that, you know, like everyone's gear, we had flown in Aaron's gear, everyone's gear, like, you know, to make this, you know, Tim's in Tim's studio, we were like, man, we've, this sounds great. And, and like, sometimes when you're paying a guy a, a really high rate per day, you don't feel like you have, the time to sit there and chase each other's like good vibes. You know, it's more of like when you got a producer, you're like, man, we're paying down at the ass for this. Like, let's work, let's track, let's make the song as good as we can. Let's talk about how we can make this song better when you're doing it yourself. And there is no time limit because you're just being a band with your friends the way it started. It's like, let's, jam this if it takes one hour if it takes 15 days to get this song to feel right we're gonna do that because yeah we, that's what we're doing here we're trying to like if you're happy i'm happy and chris is happy and aaron's happy then there's an under song you know and a lot of times in the studio you don't have that that chance because it's weird you know like putting an outsider in and then the way we work is just different i think yeah. Do you got I mean you yeah. guys you know each other, you know you've got that relationship there, you can trust each <clears> other and you can, you know, build off those reactions, like you say, that kind of makes it exciting, keeps you guys interested, keeps the listener interested right there, right? Yeah, I think I think for us that was a learning process. Like I think that was the only thing that came up when we were talking about doing it ourselves was like, do we have that trust? Do we do, do is Spencer okay for me to tell him? he's flat or sharp and needs to do it over. Even if he thinks he, it's good, 
and it's not coming from a bad place. Or when Speed goes, dude, that guitar lead, I've heard you play that on 10 songs in the past and it's trash. Like, instead of me going, dude, you're right, am I going to get defensive? And, and, and Chris and everyone, right? It's like, we took that gamble and there was a few times where we had to like recenter and recalibrate. Um, but I, I think that that work in my head is why you pay a producer. Like bands don't believe in themselves enough. And a lot of bands are dysfunctional to the point where they need a referee or a life coach. But it, it, and that's the bigger idea of a producer. And it's like when you go to someone like that, and you're paying for a studio and you have someone else's undivided attention, it feels less creative. And it's more like something that on the front end seems fun like oh we're going to disney for four days like that sounds relaxing it's vacation but the second you get into that hotel everyone that's with you is like we got to go here because we only have three days left and we got to hit this park we're tired i'd rather just go take a nap and sit in the hot tub at the hotel but we can't because we're only at disney for four days right and it's like this idyllic like it's gonna be memories and relaxing turns into like this pressure and it's like vacation is a studio and a producer like being at home is like being here with no producer. And it's like, you can clean the house at midnight or you can clean it tomorrow because it's nothing's going anywhere. And it's like, that I think sounds like a death trap of laziness and procrastination on the front surface. But in actuality, when you don't have that pressure, like Spencer was saying, now my ideas are flowing better. Now his ideas are flowing better. And now we don't feel like we have to get through a producer who's yelling at the engineer to chase an 808 click clack thing that became hallelujah, which would never happen in a studio, you know, because those producers are good and they're writers and they can see where it's going before you do. And it's like, bro, pause, let me do my job in this band and let Spencer do his job and let us do our job and then come back to me with thoughts. And that's just not how production relationships work, especially with this whole co-writing thing that's going around. Everyone wants to be in the room and change just enough to be a composer on the song. And everyone has publishing deals and it's a whole thing. And it's like, it's just gross. And I'm not interested in doing it. And I, I write the best music of my life with my friends and that's it. You yeah. know what I mean? No, no, it's a good attitude to have. It's a change in mindset. And I think it, you know, from what I've heard so far, it seems like a really positive move for you guys. It feels like it's really, really playing to your strengths, which is very exciting to hear. Um, a couple more things yeah. I do want to mention before I let you go as well. Uh, as much as, yeah, this is very much uh, from, you know, you guys and your voice there. There is a collab on the record that we've not heard yet, but I'm very excited about. You've got yeah. those on there. Uh, talk to me a little bit about working with them and how that collab came together. Oh, man. What a weird thing. So we were talking about, uh, there's a song called Cycle. And we were like, dude, like, what if we did something cool? We don't have features ever. And we were talking about like, you know, what if we got this guy or this guy? And it was like, should we get a guy from a, a rock band? Or do we try to get like a rapper or something? And like Ghost Mane came up and, and in the kind of that weird avant-garde hip hop, but still rock center. Um, and we reached out to him and uh, Spencer hit him up on Instagram direct. Uh, our manager was trying to reach out to people and literally randomly one day, Eric Whitney, who is ghost main Eric Instagram messaged Aaron, our drummer and was just like, Hey man, just wanted to thank you guys for everything you did. Like I wouldn't have my music career if it wasn't for you guys. Like he's Florida kid grew up listening to you. And Aaron's like, thanks, dude. But we've been trying to get a hold of you. And he hadn't seen the, the, like, the messages. And he's like, for what? And then we're like, we want you on our song. And you're just checking in to say, thanks for being a band that helped you go. And it was just <laughs> this wild thing. And then uh, Tim Smith, his manager, who used to manage Norma Jean, where our old buds, uh, texted me randomly. He's like, Tim, like, send me the track. Uh, I'll send it to Eric. And this is like after two weeks of silence. And then Aaron calls me two minutes later. I got a hold of ghost man. What do I do? He doesn't even know anything about this. And like the second that it connected, like Spencer got a reply, a management got a reply. We got a reply. And then we sent him the track and he's like, I love it. And that's it. That's the only remote thing we did on the whole record. He recorded yeah. it with his dog, Arthur, and literally sent it back. And we were like, that's it done send me the files and we're over and it turned out really cool 
Man, really, really yeah, we... excited to hear that one. It feels like yeah. a, a very interesting club that I imagine fits very, very well with, between the two styles, right? It was it was crazy because we had that bridge. Like, it, it was such a long pause of, like, we had left the studio. Me and Aaron had flown home. We had recorded a bridge already for it. Yeah. In case, because, like Tim said, we never do a feature. Yeah, the feature... That- feature wasn't going to happen at one point. It was yeah. just like, nobody's getting back to us. <laughs> yeah. We had shot like we, so we had we, that, the conversation came because we we're like, man, Aaron and Spencer are on every single bridge. Like we just wanted to do something different that we haven't done ever. And, uh, but we recorded our bridge that we wrote when we wrote the song because we were like, just in case. And I swear I was home in the gym, just, listening to the like rough mixes going like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. At least our bridge is good, you know, like, and then when it, when it clicked, it was like, it was such a game changer. Um, I'm excited for people to hear that song. Cause it's wild. It's not even what I thought or expected when ghost main sent it back. So if that makes your brain yeah. tick a little, I was like, wait, what? I was like, so taken back from like i was like i didn't expect him to do what he did even yeah uh, uh, so it's tight man yeah. ah, exciting one there very very exciting one to look forward to um gents it's really nice chatting. i'll leave you with this which is i guess live plans like we say the tour is in the books for the states we hope to see you of course over here when you can make it over here but uh the states and what a lineup you've got there my god that is a hell of a stacked lineup on that tour man you guys must be so excited to finally not only get back out on the road but with such a crowd pleasing lineup like that, it's, it's really exciting times, right? Dude. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, we were so pissed when management and our agent were like, we think we should push it to February because we don't know how the COVID thing is going to go in quarter three and four. And now we're here and all of our friends that are on tour are like canceling shows and everything's changing. I'm like, they like, that's why we have a smart team and we have to like trust them. But yeah. It's going to be so fun. It just feels so far away. I just want to like go to sleep and like wake up in January, have the record out, be on tour. It's like that's still four months away. Yeah. But I, the four months is going to fly by. I know it will, but right now it seems like an, a distant hope, not something that's real, but it is and it's going to rule. No, it makes sense, man. It feels like it's going to be the right moment and work super, super well for you guys. I'm you know, excited to see it. And like I say, we're obviously excited to see you guys come over here when that is allowed, whenever that may be. Uh, fingers crossed it will yeah. be sooner rather than later, man. But uh, we, know, we know you'll be over here at some point. We can't wait to hear these songs live. And uh, yeah, just in the meantime, Jets, I'm sure we'll catch up around the album release itself. Best of luck with everything till then and just stay safe out there, all right? Cheers, all right, brother. Man. You as well. I appreciate it, guys. All right, Spencer, Tim, everybody.